Hello everybody and welcome to SFF 180. I am back. Thomas here as always. I'm so glad that you have joined me. November, as you know by now, has been moving month. I'm actually recording this early on, which accounts for why I'm in the same library. Uh, but before all of this begins in earnest, and oh god, is it going to begin in earnest? <laughs> I, I promised you guys something, didn't I? I promised it a while back. In fact, I promised it right around the time I hit 2,000 subscribers, and now I'm at just a little over 2,500, and so I'm a bit overdue. Yeah, I tend to, I tend to be like that. I, I run late on things. It's who I am as a person. I'm very sorry. It's been a bane of my existence, but I'm not going to let you guys down on this one, mainly because the act of moving forces me to tidy up this library before actually dismantling it altogether. But I wanted you guys to see it. I've been wanting you guys to see it for some time, and I want to have a record of this library as it was. You know, granted, it's going to be a bit tidier <laughs> when you get to see it as it's been in a long time. It's really quite nice, actually, tidying it up. I, I kind of wish I'd been doing this all these years. But, uh, but it's happening now, and you're going to have a little bit of a tour starting right now. Okay, the first thing you're going to notice is this corner. We're going to start right here. This is a corner you're likely to recognize. Indeed, this is the YouTube setup, uh, the channel setup. This is where I have been recording every single episode of SFF 180 you have ever seen. Sitting right here in this corner between these two shelves. Gonna miss this corner, I think. Uh, even though new days a beckon ahead in the future. Now, I've seen bookshelf tours and library tours and things like that from many, many other booktubers over the years. And one thing you'll notice is that there's not a whole lot here that's fancy. A lot of booktubers love to indulge themselves. They decorate their shelves very attractively. They put knickknacks and doodads up there. They, they circle the whole thing in, in Christmas lights. Or they'll just arrange their books in an attractive fashion. Maybe they'll organize everything by the color of the spines, which uh, can look really neat. Uh, sadly, when you have this many books, uh, you just you turn into a librarian. It, it becomes all very basic. Just shelve the damn things, alphabetical by author, get them up there. Yeah, I, I wish I could be more creative than, than I have been in the past, but this is what you get. Uh, because what you're going to see as we pan around is there's a whole heck of a lot more of this. Yep, take a look. It goes this way. It continues on from, I guess, the A's through the D's through the E's, uh, downward uh, through the rest of the alphabet. And I have something that probably most people don't have in their homes with their private uh, libraries. I have aisles. Take a look at these shelves. The shelves themselves are a very interesting story. They might even be a more interesting story than the books on them. Well, I wouldn't say that. A lot of lovely books on these shelves, but the shelves and how I came about them, um, it's a bit of a tale. It's a bit of a saga on its own. All of these shelves came from Borders. Now, if you're in the States, you will know that Borders for many, many years was the main competitive chain to Barnes & Noble. We had two major bookstore brick-and-mortar chains, Borders, Barnes & Noble. Due to gross, horrible mismanagement uh, down through the years, uh, Borders, in fact, I think at one point they went through something like nine CEOs within the span of a year. It was crazy. They just didn't really know what they were doing. So Borders went out of business right around the early 2010s, or right around the, the beginning of the decade. And it was a real blow uh, to the, uh, the book-selling business here in this country you know, losing one of the major chains. And Barnes & Noble really didn't make up that slack. Amazon maybe made up some more of it, but um, it was looking really, really bleak for brick and mortar book sales here in the country for a little while. But, you know, things may be stable, I don't know. Barnes & Noble keeps hanging on by its fingernails. But anyway, back to the shelves. Now, I got two different sets of shelving from Borders during two different periods. I did get some shelving from my neighborhood location when they shut down. I put about five or six very tall bookshelves uh, on hold, and they are out in my garage. Um, but these shelves in here, of which there are, I believe, eight, uh, came from an earlier period in the life of Borders. Uh, this was before they were going out of business, but it was maybe around 2007, I'm going to say, 2008. I think 2008. 
when the writing was on the wall that you know things were not going well and the you know the whole business was kind of starting to slip a little bit because you would see them starting to eliminate certain sections of the store. Um, first off, I think right around 2005, they got rid of all the CDs, so for obvious reasons there. But then, a couple of years later, they stopped selling movies. They stopped selling DVDs. And they eliminated that whole section from the store. And when they did, at my, again, my old neighborhood location, I saw that the shelves themselves, the entire section, including all the shelving, was going away. And I talked to a manager at the time, and I said, what are you going to do with these bookshelves? Because at the time, you know, my library was starting to grow, all the review copies I was getting in, I was worried about storing them, I thought, maybe I can score some shelving. So I spoke to the manager, and he said, well, you know, I don't know, maybe some of our employers are going to claim some of these, but uh, why don't you come by, you know, like tomorrow, day after tomorrow, something like that, and, and we'll work something out. You know, and I'm prepared to, you know, like talk about what would this cost, you know, what would you charge me for like two or three of these things. So I come back in about two days' time, and I speak to a different manager. And uh, that guy says, oh yeah, you should be able to find them. Just drive around back of the store. So I did that. I wheeled around to the back of the store. And what they had done, I'm not kidding you guys, was all of this shelving that you see right here in this room with all the books on it, they had thrown them in the trash. I'm going to repeat that because it sounds astonishing to me even now to say it. They had thrown these shelves in the big dumpster. This is easily, if you were to buy these in a furniture shop, you're looking at about $1,000, $1,200, dollars worth of bookshelves right here. They just chucked them, all of them, including these end caps here. So I was immediately presented with a quandary. I'm like, holy shit, I've got to get these things home before anybody else comes back around here and tries to get them, or before they get picked up, right? So what to do? I didn't have a truck. My only friend who had a truck was working. Um, my vehicle <laughs> is a 2006 Toyota Corolla, not exactly made uh, to hold any of these big bad boys. And so I didn't know what to do. Well, so I, oh, actually, I did know what to do. It was the only thing I could do. It was insane, but I didn't really see that I had any options. So here's what I did. I took each one of these shelves, I, I cleared out the trunk of my car, folded down the back seat. They were just wide enough to, like, here's the width of, of my open trunk, and here's the bookshelves, right? So just wide enough, and shoving them all the way in with the back seat folded down, about half of the book <laughs> bookcase fit that way. Half of it was sticking out the ass end of the back, right? So that's how I got these home. I made eight separate trips over a period of four and a half hours. Each bookshelf, I slid it right in to the back of my trunk, right? Closed the lid very carefully, tied it down as best I could with a little piece of twine that I had, drove slowly home with the hazard lights going. I did that eight times over a period of, like I said, a little over four hours, and I got every one of these shelves home. And I even got these little end caps, which are just decorative. And when the store went out of business, like I said, a couple of years later, I, I collected one of their, uh, their section signs for the science fiction fantasy section, and that adorns the top, as you see right there. But it was the craziest day. It was just the weirdest experience, but the best, most amazing score I think I've ever had <laughs> in terms of free stuff. So I got all these free, and I got them home in a Toyota Corolla. So how's that for an epic saga? So, uh, here we are, as you see, and we, slip, we shift around this way, and we continue with the hardcover and mostly trade paperback fiction permanent library here. This is not everything that I own. Uh, what you're not seeing here are mass market paperbacks. Uh, most of these I've already boxed and, and uh, you know, put away, packed away, ready to be shipped off. Uh, shoved in the back of a U-Haul. The mass market paperbacks, I'll read them and then just get rid of them. I'll either give them to a friend or take them to half price books to trade them in. But I don't keep mass market paperbacks generally, unless it's like a book I really, really loved and I just want to have it on the shelf. Uh, it also doesn't account for ARCs, you know, again, which I uh, read and then recycle or give to friends. I uh, can't really sell those, um, but I'll give them away or, or if it's just 
something that I don't think anybody else will be interested in, I'll just recycle them. They're meant for that, right? I mean, arcs are meant to be disposable. Publishers really would not rather that they stick around after the actual book is out because they're uncorrected. And again, they're just made for promotional purposes. So I am well aware, uh, especially at my age, that uh, I own a ridiculous number of books. I think I've estimated my permanent library to be at around 3,500 items. Uh, but I'm well aware that I own more books than I am ever likely to read in my natural lifetime. Uh, that doesn't especially bother me. You know, there's something about just being surrounded by books, just being immersed in a library of, of literature, of other worlds worlds of the imagination, stories surround me. I feel like I'm surrounded by universes. Sometimes I'm just like sitting here and looking at all of them. So most of this is my SFF library in here. Uh, you're gonna see here, here are a couple of other shelves though. Um, this one particular one here along this back wall is for uh, the non-SFF stuff. I have a little bit of comics and graphic work on the very top shelf here. Moving down the shelf here, you're gonna see some history, a lot of history, and that's my, that's sort of my nonfiction go-to. A lot of history appeals to me, ancient history. Um, I like historical true crime. I like strange little accounts like this. This is a book, uh, The Dancing Plague, which is about a strange phenomenon, a, a mass hysteria that happened in the Middle Ages. Where people literally danced themselves to death. Uh, here's a writer I like a lot, John Kelly. This is an extremely accessible account of the Black Death in the 14th century. And then later on, he followed it up with uh, this book here, which is an account of the Irish potato famine. And so he's, he's a very good writer. Harold Schechter is a, a favorite author of mine for historical true crime. I, I like reading about unsolved murders and mysteries and, and weird incidents in the past. And then down at the very bottom, I have a little bit of stuff on science and skepticism. You know, things that are things, things I'm fond of, but not perhaps you know, as into that as I was a few years ago. And then moving over here is a movie shelf. Uh, this cabinet here, I, I actually had uh, commissioned from a wood, wood worker, a place here uh, that, that makes cases like this, just a little local business. As with uh, a lot of my reading, my taste in movies runs well outside the mainstream. You're gonna see most of this cabinet here uh, as, uh, is Criterion Collection stuff. Um, you know, old films, classic films, foreign films, strange, weird art films. Uh, I just, that's what I get off to. Uh, I tend to prefer older movies to new ones, current Hollywood movies. I mean, technically they're all very impressive, but I find that a lot of them uh, don't feature terribly good storytelling. And um, it's just, it's more about the spectacle and, uh, and the, the ridiculous amounts of money they spend. But not very many of them tell terribly good stories. And the ones that do tell really good stories, but then maybe the movies themselves aren't necessarily keepers. You know, you can, I can watch them once and be satisfied with the experience. Um, so it takes a little bit of you know, something unique. There has to be something that speaks to me very personally uh, in, a, in a movie for me to call it a keeper. I, I also love, uh, you know, cult horror stuff uh, from the old days, John Carpenter movies movies, um, old Italian giallo horror films, love those. And if you are making new movies out there, a great way to persuade me to add you to my collection is be Asian. Love Asian cinema, Hong Kong, Japanese cinema, um, uh, Korean cinema. There's a lot of excellent, exciting work. And there you have it, the SFF 180 library. And uh, now where I'm moving to, is uh, gonna be a bit of a smaller space. So a lot of these shelves and many of the books on them are gonna go into storage. I am picking out uh, select titles uh, to that will go you know, into the my new office, gonna have a really nice proper office with room, I think for about three or maybe four of these shelves, and that'll be fine. Won't be overwhelming in the interior space. You know, I'll have my workstation, my area where I can shoot and record and edit and stuff like that, and then I'll have just a nice, a collection of books behind me and, and that will be fine, you know, and I don't mind having a lot of these, you know, it's going to be in climate controlled storage and everything is going to be really cool. And, um, you know, and then down the road a piece, you know, we'll see where I live after, after, after this, you know, the, the goal eventually is to, you know, when I have my own home, you know, have a, a proper custom library where everything will fit. And that will be a very exciting day indeed. But for now, I have a busy, busy month ahead of me.
One of the reasons that I love science fiction so much is that it tells us we have a future, you know, and generally speaking, the course of history is that the future tends to work out for the better, even if, in many times, to get to the better place, we have to go through a really bad place. Science fiction gives me confidence and gives me hope, ultimately, that we'll have a better future. And so I'll be here. You can always find me here at SFF 180 to share with you the wonders and the hope of science fiction. So thank you all for joining me, and I will see you guys on the other side of this move. Until then, happy reading.